Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us at Mechanics Institute online for our program, Murder at the Porte de Versailles, an Amy Leduc investigation set in Paris with author Kara Black. I'm Laura Shepard, Director of Events at Mechanics Institute. And if you're new to us, Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. We feature our general interest library, an international chess club, our ongoing author and literary programs, and our Friday night cinema lit film series. Please see our website at milibrary.org and come visit us in person because we are open. If you'd like to purchase um, the book, Murder at the Porte de Versailles, um, it will be available. The pub date is now March 15th and Kara is holding it up. And you can uh, also go to alexanderbook.com to purchase books or visit an independent bookstore near you. We're so thrilled to have Kara back. She's a dear friend and colleague, and we're very pleased to welcome her for her riveting 20th installment of her New York Times best-selling Parisian detective series, which her and protagonist, Amy LeDuc, in a dangerous web of international spy craft and ter terrorist threats in Paris. Uh, in the 15th arrondissement. Kara, um, along with the series, is also the author of, the, of a thriller, Three Hours in Paris. And she's received multiple nominations for the Anthony and McAvey, McCavity Award in Norwegian, Spanish, Italian, French, Japanese, and Hebrew. Uh, Kara comes to us, she lives in San Francisco, of course, and visits Paris often. So please welcome back Kara Black. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. So nice to be here. So nice to be at the Mechanics Institute from my kitchen in Noe Valley. Um, how are you all? It's, it's nice to be out there. And Laura was just asking me, am I touring and it's sort of a hybrid book tour, which I guess is what we're doing these days. We're getting to come out and a little bit emerge and doing some bookstores, uh, doing you know a lot of you know Zoom events. Uh, last weekend I was in LA at Romans. It was very interesting. Everyone was masked and had to show their vaccination. Tomorrow I'm going to the Tucson Book Festival, which is outdoors, you know, it's it at the university, it's open air. So um, it'll be interesting to see how that's handled, you know, uh, whether we're in tents with masks or, you know, it's always, of course, hard to speak, right? If you're not, uh, if you've got a mask on. But um, anyway, um, thank you very much. It's nice to, to talk about this story. Um, I'll just tell you about the story and then I'll talk about where it came from. So, um, it's and it's also been you know two years since I've had an Amy LeDuc book so it's very welcoming to be back in her world and the story starts uh, right after 9-11 in our country it's set in France and um, there is you know people are sort of living in a state of fear if you cast your mind back to what happened you know how how we all felt after 9-11 and in France what people uh, you know, was not well known is that right at 10 days after 9-11, there was a uh, explosion in Toulouse down south, which happened in a factory. And it was this explosive, which no one talked about, you know, and uh, this is where the French NASA is. It's where the, you know, aerospace industry is. So, you know, I, I always thought that was very interesting. Um, so, Right now, Amy LeDuc, it's November, and Amy LeDuc is at the cemetery, Père Lachaise, the famous cemetery, with her daughter and paying respects to her father's mausoleum because he, actually his, his ashes, he was, it's the anniversary of his death. He was killed in a mysterious bomb explosion in Place Vendôme. And Amy is with her daughter, Chloe, the three-year-old, 
It's very bittersweet because it's Chloe's birthday. So after they pay their respects, they go back to Amy's apartment on Ile Saint Louis, you know, to have a great birthday party. And Chloe is so excited. You know, she's three years old. She, she got these uh, fuzzy kind of zebra striped boots for her birthday and she won't, she sleeps with them, right? She can't take them off. She's a little fashionista in training like her mother. And, um, and at the party, Amy feels that there is her family around her, even though she's lost her father and her American mother abandoned her, you know, when she was small. There's Commissaire Morbier, her godfather, who we've met in previous Amy Le Duc books. And Morbier is so proud of Chloe, he calls her that his, she's his, she, he's her great godfather. <laughs> and Rene Frion, who is her partner at the detective agency, uh, is the godfather. He's running around, you know, taking videos because remember in 2001, we were using video cameras. We were dialing up. Remember dial up? We were paying in francs and uh, you could smoke in the cafes just, just to let you know. <laughs> and so at this time at the party, Boris Biard is there with his boyfriend Michu and they're they're wonderful and they babysit Chloe all the time, dear friends. Melak is there, who is the biological father of Chloe. And Melak is pressuring Amy. You know, he's living up in Brittany now. He's got this farm. He said, we can live there. You could do IT remotely. Now, I think that happened because I was writing, of course, this story during the pandemic. But of course, they, you could do that. Uh, he said, Chloe would, you know, have sea air, you know, they have, have goats, we have horses, there's vegetable garden, how healthy it would be, you know, on the sea. And Amy is like, um, you know, she likes to live where there's a cafe on the corner. And she doesn't think there's any cafes at the end of the farm field. So, but she's wondering, you know, am I being selfish? She's feeling guilty. Is this something she should do for her daughter? Could this work? So she's sort of suffering these kind of you know, inner conflicts, he's pressuring her. And they're just about, you know, a wonderful party, champagne and foie gras and a special kind of macaroon cake because this is Paris after all, right? Even though it's a three-year-old's birthday party, just about to open the presents. And Boris VR goes, oh, mon Dieu, I forgot Chloe's birthday gift. It's on the desk at my work. He works at the police lab finishes his champagne, jumps in a taxi and goes to the police lab. So the party continues and it ends. Everybody goes home, Chloe's put to bed. Mishu is in the kitchen washing up the champagne flutes and Amy is like, where, where is Boris? He hasn't returned. They get a phone call and there has been a bomb explosion at the police laboratory. Boris is found in the rubble with um, traces of the explosive on his under his fingernails. So Boris is a suspect in the bombing. And Boris is still alive when he's recovered. Immediately he's taken and he's a suspect. And the police who he's worked with, you know, will not listen to anything. Amy is determined this is impossible. I mean, how could he have done this? Why would he do this? And even the laboratory techs who Boris worked with every day are turning against him. You know, the evidence is almost so clear. And so Amy has to struggle to try and convince people. And everything she does, she finds things that look more damning to his case. Um, so along the way, Morbier um, is telling her to leave it alone. And Melak is going, you know, it's just no good. You know, something happened. So that's where the, you know, the story is. And it, and it goes from there. So I think what I realized is um, my editor was saying that she really liked working on this story because she could go back into Amy LeDuc's world, you know, and it was a nice place to go during the pandemic, a world we knew, or, you know, we knew fictionally. And, and I agreed, you know, with all the characters and all the, you know, things that they face and that um, she felt the theme, um, in the story was family. And I thought, you know, I, I, I didn't know that. Of course, I'll, my editor always has to tell me, but I think so. And that really came from writing about this 
15th arrondissement. And I'm sorry, I'm looking out the window and there are people on the roof of the house right there. Oh my God, they were, but they're fine, they're roofers. <laughs> I thought they were firemen. And so it's really about the 15th arrondissement. Now, the 15th arrondissement has a population the size of Bordeaux, a lot of people. It is the second largest land-wise um, uh, arrondissement in Paris. You've probably gone through it. There is, you, but you people don't really go there unless you live there. There's no monuments. It, part of it does border the Seine, and there's a wedge of the 15th that just borders the 7th. So it's very she-she, you know, very nice. The schools are very good. So people, what they say is when you say to someone, oh, I live in Paris in the 15th, they do this because it's generally speaking, you know, you, you grow up, you, you know, you party when you're in university, you know, you hang out, you go to the clubs and the bars and the nightlife, wherever you are in Saint-Germain or in the Marais or in the 11th. And then you get married and then you have children. And that's where you move if you can afford it with kids because the schools are good. So that's kind of where you go. And People like Anne Hidalgo, the mayor of Paris, lives there. Francois Hollande, the former um, president, the one who was seeing his mistress on the moped, you know, <laughs> he lives there. But they, it's very low key, you know, it's not, no one is, you know, they live in an apartment, it's very, they keep it on the lowdown. So again, it's, you know, and then there's these pockets of working class, you know, and pockets of what was working class before because where there are a lot of new apartments, uh, not necessarily what we like, you know, Amer as Americans, we love those house Manian or these are more 60s, 70s, 80s kind of modern. Um, those were built on where the old Citroen car um, uh, manufacturing factory was. And so that was, so there, you know, you think there, there was a lot of workers and there were these little lanes with small, you know, two story houses, workers houses that are not, not really affordable much anymore, but still very picturesque. There's also Parc Georges Brassin, named after the folk singer, um, which is next to where the police laboratory is. And this park was the former abattoir slaughterhouse, uh, you know, for horse, mainly horses, but beef as well. Because remember, before refrigerators were in wide use, um, people had ice boxes, literally, or they would just go and buy fresh horse meat or meat every day, you know, like they buy fresh eggs, they go buy fresh milk, um, all that kind of thing. So um, the, the um, old abattoir is now, and they sort of cut it off, but you see the book stalls, that is part of the antique book book um, market on the weekends, every weekend, because it's underneath and they cut this off, but it's an old glass ceiling, Art Nouveau, um, what do I want to call structure, right? For a market designed by Eiffel. I mean, he designed not only the Eiffel Tower, he, you know, he designed many things in the city. So it's this uh, roof with glass, you know, with the wrought iron around it, that was the old horse mark, horse butchery that's now, uh, left and you should go if you're in you know Paris go there on the weekend it's really lovely and um, then you are right on the park and you're there's a little they have the wine they have grapes little tiny vineyard and then across is the police laboratory the biological police laboratory which is there next to the car impound next to the uh, central laboratory of Paris where they have the arson investigations the explosives, and next to that around the corner is the Objet Trouvé, lost and found. If you've ever lost your umbrella in the metro or your sunglasses <clears throat> and someone turned them in, they've gone there and you can go there and fill out a form and triplicate and wait and it's very Balzacian and get, usually you get your, your material back. Um, you know, it's just amazing. And um, so, and I, and upstairs they have a, cafeteria for lunch where everyone from the labs go and eat and oh I have I have to tell you they really need to improve that <laughs> it's like canteen food everywhere I got to go there with the lab techs 
But so, um, so this area where the police lab is, in, is, um, is real. They have since moved, since I wrote this story, and I'm gonna open this window because it's so hot. The, um, and the story came from, came from what one of my friends told me about. He used to live in, a, in Rue de Danzig, which is where this, you know, where this police lab is. He literally lived in this family apartment across from the police laboratory. His windows overlooked it. And he was maybe 10, I'm not sure. He said he woke up in the middle of the night, he'd fallen out of bed and he didn't know what was going on. And he heard this thing. There was a bomb at the police laboratory, literally across from his window. In the morning, his parents said, oh yeah, there was a bomb explosion, but you know, everything's okay. It was just the Basques again. <laughs> Those Basque separatists, you know, always bombing in Paris. And very un unlike our country, I mean, it happened a lot. And it was a political statement. And they were proud, were Basques were very proud. They wanted to separate from Spain and France. They're proud that no one was ever hurt. Okay, because it was a political statement. Around that time, 86, 87, I'm not sure, I can't remember, there was a bombing at Interpol. Now Interpol used to be in Boulogne, just across the river from Paris, if you keep on going right there before it moved to Lyon. And there was a huge bombing. No one was killed. People were, a few, the guard was injured um, and there was a, all these explosives thrown inside and it wreaked a lot of damage, blew out the windows from the whole neighborhood. And um, this was done by terrorists who were from, from the, uh, with links. They weren't really sure they had so, all these theories. And I thought that was so interesting. And a policeman told me about it. He introduced me to his friend who worked at Interpol, who introduced me to a man who used to work at Interpol at that time, who had been there, who'd been in Paris and went with, you know, went with the group to go respond. They were eating dinner in Paris. And, and um, but it was so interesting to connect with this man because I wasn't given his real name. And I was told that he would call me because I couldn't call him. So he called me from Algeria. And we had this really fascinating phone call uh, when he told me about it, you know, and so a lot of that I could use right in, in the story. And what I think is, you know, that this guy is a spy, right? Still <laughs> calling me from Algiers. It was pretty cool. Um, so he told me about that. And I really wanted to incorporate that in the story as well as um, my friend who is in my book group is from Iran. And she said, well, Kara, if you're writing about the 15th, my cousin lives there because she lives in this uh, area, part of the 15th, which is called Teheran, Teheran Sur Sen, you know, Tehran on the, on the Sen. There's a huge enclave of Iranians, Persian people. And there's Persian restaurants, which I've eaten in, shops. Uh, you know, it's, it's not very big, but you know, there's a definite influence. And I said, well, and I just was like, I don't understand this. And she said, well, first of all, we're Persians because you know that's what we prefer to be called. And of course I knew as she is, many people, many of them are sophisticated, well-educated and they're very uh, sophisticated. So a lot of them came in the sixties and early seventies with petrodollars, right? A lot of money. And they bought apartments in the 15th. And they would, of course, you know, stay there part of the year, send their kids into the Sorbonne. Actually, the Shah of Iran met his, his the woman who became his wife, the Faradiba, in Paris. She was studying, maybe this was the late 50s, you know, she was studying architecture, you know, and her father had studied in Paris. So there's this great um, kind of relationship between Persia, Ir Iran, and French. And so there were these people who bought apartments, who were very cultured. And then there were the people, so the Shah was deposed, I believe, 79. So then they had to flee, right? The people that were still in that milieu, right? 
wealthy people with money or without the money, you know, I mean, they just had to leave. So all those came, people came, the emigre culture. And then after that, and, and Defara Diba, I think she now lives in Washington, D.C., or outside Washington, but she used to live on the Quai d'Orsay in Paris, you know. Um, but they have a very special relationship with France. And then there were the people, the Revolutionary Guard under the Ayatollahs, who had um, a, a hit list, so, or, you know, people they wanted to get back at who had fled with the Shah. And so they would have this hit list and they would send um, prox assassins, proxy assassins. They would hire them, you know, from other places. The one I heard about were the Palestinian Marxists. Palestinian Marxists hired to hit targets in, in France, you, you know, Pers Iranians. So, I mean, the police told me that. And it was an ongoing, long running, um, issue that the uh, that the their security service like our our you know uh, the national security service you know they had their name they were out for these guys you know because they were uh, protecting one of the shah's last uh, secretaries in the government who was very liberal who was trying to start negotiations you know who was you know really trying to to make something happen and um and they they attacked and killed him even though he was guarded by french police and it took them 15 years and they found a guy but so they're very much you know that their honor was hurt that you know he was killed on french soil so i heard all these stories you know it was just fascinating that all this residential area had these sort of seething conflicts underneath and uh, of course any place where people live and live in families of course there's going to be issues right we all have them so I really wanted to write about that. Again, it has no huge monumental monuments value, but I felt it was very, very French. And um, I just walked around, I met people. And actually in the, in the story, there's a butcher, a Monsieur Lebel, and his shop is where I say it is. And Monsieur Lebel, who's in his nineties is working. I mean, I haven't seen him for two years, so I hope he's still there. Uh, he's like one of the last horse butchers in, in Paris, you know, because that's sort of gone out of fashion. But um, yeah, he was telling me about when he worked at this market. And of course, in my story, Amy has to go there to Monsieur Lebel because, you know, her dog, Mils Davis, Miles Davis or Bichon Frise likes horse meat. So she's got to go across Paris to go to the horse butcher. Um, and I have to say that when I was, you know, this book was nice because it, I got to take longer time with it. I mean, it was a pandemic and I had another book come out, Three Hours in Paris, the historical. So I was more time with this story. And um, I could, I, I really, be, I really fell in love with this arrondissement. I, first I was like, how can I write about such a boring place? Well, it wasn't boring at all. I really fell in love with it. Um, I love the street where Monsieur Lebel has his uh, butcher shop. I started going to a wonderful independent, well, there's a couple of them in, in one little group, Le Divan. And because it was raining one day and it was cold and I ran into this wonderful bookstore where there were just sofas everywhere, divans, you know, and wonderful children's section or whatever. And I just sat there, you know, and just, I mean, it's all French, but it's just wonderful. I love that bookstore, you know, and I really wanted to, I used, I got to use that place in, in the scene. And uh, I love the market. There's one market I really love, Rue, on Rue Saint Charles. I don't remember which day, but I, I will go, I will go across town wherever I am to go to that market because I like it because they have many different things. They've got a great, uh, uh, where do you call it, like charcuterie place for takeout. You know, it's, there's, a, you know, it's a man is grinding knives, sharpening knives, like he has a little thing. You know, it's just, I love it. You know, it's just very French. And, you know, why wouldn't you cross town to go there, get fresh, fresh items and uh, a good bakery. And I mean, when you talk to someone who lives in the 15th arrondissement, you say, where, you know, tell me some good spots and they'll tell you their cheesemonger and the where they buy their fish and the butcher and the bakery where they get their pollen bread. I mean, because, 
you know, and I've talked to so many people in the 15th and they said, our, our cheese shop, it's the best in Paris. Just, just come here, just for, don't worry, just come here. You know? So, I mean, they're very much a part of their, of their quartier and, uh, you know, the children's school and, you know, it's, um, it's just very family oriented and in a way that feels so French away from tourism and uh, I don't know. I, I like it. I really liked it a lot. I really felt that I I could uh, relate to it in many ways. Uh, what else can I tell you? Oh, and a lot of the store. Oh, then I got to, and I won't keep going on. But my friend, I met a woman. I was introduced by a policeman to the woman who runs the police laboratory where Boris worked, and she ran it. It's the biological police laboratory where. They go to the police, go to a crime scene and they take blood, semen, any kind of chemical evidence and they send it to this lab. Right. And they process it and they send it back to the police or to court. And it's, you know, it's very quick. They're very good. They only they don't do foot fingerprints unless there's blood, you know, a bloody fingerprint. But that's a special unit. And so they're down from just a few doors down from the arson center and the bomb center. So she took me on a tour. I went to visit them three times. And I think they all got sick of me, but they took me around. And there of all the women, biologists, scientists, and techs, there's only two men in this laboratory. It's run by a woman, as well as the arson and abundance. And I remember I was saying to them, oh, you're all women. <laughs> they, they go, well, yeah. And the, one of the guys said, I'm one of the two token men here, but, um, and I was just really proud. They were like, don't you have a lot of women in science and biology in the U.S.? And I'm like, no, nah, not like you. I mean, I, you know, and, and it's funny. So but she took me around many times. She took me down into this area that's like a tunnel that leads to the next building. She also showed me where the specimens are kept. I mean, it's, you know, and it has to be cold and refrigerated. And then we walked out into the parking lot, which is behind the borders of the park. And there were several portable uh, refrigeration units, you know, like big, big freezer things that were portable. And I said, oh, well, what's that? She goes, well, you know, you saw how cramped it is. And you saw how our, our you know, we only have one big giant freezer, it, it broke down. So we had to rent these portable refrigeration units out in, this, out in the parking lot. And I was just like, wow. You know, they just had to make do and, and work the best way they can because that's, you know, property specimens, evidence used in a court case, right? I mean, the, that needs to be uh, protected. So it was really interesting to see how real life works in the police laboratory. I also, you know, took her out to dinner I bought her wine and she's just wonderful. I also took um, the arson specialist out for lunch. Uh, well, I, I was introduced to him and he was coming and he was late and it was, you know, it was fine. He was coming for lunch and he came and he apologized profusely. I'm sorry, I'm so late. I had to, you know, and I said, I was working. I said, hey, no problem. You're doing me a favor. Thank you for coming. He goes, well, I was at Notre Dame because this was two weeks at that time after the fire in Notre Dame. And uh, so he was there, you know, doing the arson investigation. He was the head of it and showing us photos. I mean, he couldn't tell us very much, but, you know, just how painstaking their uh, examination and investigation had to be. The, um, and then I met an explosive expert with the F FBI who, you know, on the phone and he told me, he said, well, here's, here's what you need to know. Uh, testing for explosives is painstaking as well, you know, because it just has to be done. You think, think of an explosion, you know, think of it, you know, it, and, and it blows out of, into a thousand, 50,000, a hundred thousand pieces. And as a person, you know, trying to figure out the, the cause and, you know, all the factors, you know, you have to, it's like putting this kind of puzzle back together again. You take a Q-tip, you know, and you go on a, a, you swab from a street sign, you know, a block away, you know, 
you've got to put all these things together. It's just amazingly intricate and difficult and painstaking. And so I really admired those people. But um, it, it's a really incredible job. And it's so interesting how they talk about, oh, we'll just send the robot in, you know, <laughs> you know, because they don't want to go in, right? Who would? But uh, it's very common. It's very common in France. So um, sadly, um, because they have this tradition of bombing for political uh, significance. Laura, I think I've talked a lot. Are there any questions or comments? Well, first of all, Kara, I just wanted to say this book is, is really quite amazing because it is so potent, the, the time and the place uh, being two months after 9-11 and how that has impacted the world of U.S. and the world and also knowing how much terrorism came after that in Paris. And so your way of combining the suspense mystery and also portraying both the arrondissement and also the characters uh, it is just so potent. And I'm wondering if you'd like to, before we go to questions, would you like to read a passage or two um, from your book? You know, I, I don't, the only passage I have is about eight minutes too long, is eight minutes long. And I figure, wouldn't you rather hear what I have to say? You can get the book and read it. Okay. My editor said, just, just talk to people because whatever I read, if you haven't read the book would be a spoiler. So I'm sorry, but I feel better just answering questions or, or telling you something. Sure. You know, it's, hard, it's hard reading from a mystery or thriller. Yeah, but, uh, I always enjoy when you read. But yes, we'll, we're going to keep that suspense going till March 15th when you can get your book live in person. Okay, we'd like to take questions from, from you, our audience. Um, I know we have a lot of Francophiles and Francophones here today. Uh, anyone post a question, please? Um, I, I'll, I'll ask a question. This is Pam. Um, do you... Um, I'm sure you deal with the level of prejudice against um, against uh, what the uh, Middle Eastern population in France. Did how did it compare in the wake of 9/11? How do you think it compared with what we saw here in the United States as far as paranoia about foreigners? I know that there's already some level of that in in France when it comes to when it comes to immigrants. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't in France when 9-11 happened. I was there a couple of, maybe two months before. And of course, I couldn't go back for a year or something. Um, so I don't know specifically. And I don't know how, much, how well the Iranians, again, they're Persian, but they look Arab, are uh, targeted. You know, I, I can't really speak to that because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not Iranian and I, I wasn't there. But I feel, again, you know, when you have a group of people who make an enclave, you know, like Tehran or Sen, or up in the tent, there's the, uh, the, the passageway, Little India, they call it, or something. Um, you know, where, where immigrants, emigres come and they want to be around, they want to have eat their, you know, eat the food they like, their home cooked food, they want to buy a sari, or, you know, they want to have that community around them. They kind of, which our, our ancestors did, you know, in Little Italy and, in New York and right in, in the East, uh, what do you call it, Soho, South, South of Houston, Houston, you know, whatever immigrant group, right, uh, was there. I mean, it's that kind of, but these of course were people who originally came with money. I mean, they, you know, so um, I don't know, you know, I don't know how much they're lumped, if you will, with the looking Middle Eastern or whatever, but um, one of my friends, white friends, since they've since broke up. He's from Iranian extraction. And he's more French than, than any French guy, you know, because he, he, he moved there when he was young. He was, went to the schools. He went to a very prestigious university. He's got a really good job. You know, I mean, again, you know, it's the way you look and maybe the, how your name, your name may be not, you know, typically French, you know, and how you deal with that when you're so educated, you know, when you want to be in the job market and you have all those qualifications like other white French people do. So I don't know, you know, um, I, and I also met a woman who, um, who was a doctor. She was trained as a, I think she had just gotten her degree in Tehran, 
uh, she was against the Shah and she, her husband was beheaded. She escaped from Iran, yeah. And then of course the Shah had to escape, you know, it was this, you know, just compounded, but there was a, 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 she was targeted because of course she was married to her husband. She was, you know, young and had been demonstrating. So when she had to escape to France, you know, and go undercover, she couldn't speak French. She was a doctor and she had to find other Iranians and find cleaning jobs. She started cleaning. She worked in a, you know, cleaning in a hospital. She had to teach herself French. She also had to keep her, you know, looking around her shoulder to see if any of the Shah's people, you know, she had to change her name. I have, an, I have another name. I mean, I don't know what her real name is. Uh, you know, her former name was. She taught herself French. She got into French med school. She passed the exam. She became a French doctor. She married again. And uh, it was just amazing what she told me. And, you know, she said, but I, I still don't use that name, you know. But this woman, you know, again, she was from, from a very um, obviously sophisticated, cultured, educated family in Iran, lost everything. Ground zero, didn't speak French, had to, you know, start from the beginning. So someone like that, I really admire, you know, um, and is still always looking over her shoulder. Well, she's, you know, I think she's okay, but it was, uh, it was an honor to meet her and hear her story. Um, Kate Farrell just has a comment. She says, I really enjoy hearing your enthusiasm about real life research. And um, it does seem that you, you've drawn a lot of your, what you've written from people, you, you know, it helps that you know people, you have networks in, in Paris. I am kind of curious, are you um, looking forward? I, I, I love the way that your, um, your main character grows and changes and is part of history, part of current events as these books progress. Are you looking forward to um, writing uh, any books that deal with the other things that have happened, like the uh, Ebdo massacre or the, uh, the, the massacre, the, the attacks on, you know, that took place on, was it 2016 or what, what year was it? There was uh, a The Bataclan? Yes. The Bataclan. The Bataclan. Well, first of all, thank you, Kate. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kate. I really appreciate that. You know, I, I'm just up to 2001. <laughs> I have no idea. Those things happened later. I think I've got a full plate with what was going on. Um, I don't know. I like being, you know, when we were paying in francs, it feels a little more innocent when Google, <clears throat> you didn't just Google the answer. <clears throat> Excuse me. I sort of like that. I don't know, but I think all the seeds of what happened, you know, later were, were happening then. You know, it didn't, it didn't, nothing occurs in a vacuum. So I believe all that was there present, all these, you know, tensions and culture clashes and whatever. Again, whoever did these, you know, Charlie Ebdo or who did the Bataclan, I mean, those were different too. Those were jihadi kids from Brussels who drove down. I mean, um, and you know, whatever it is. Um, but but there is a, there is a in my first book, Murder in the Marais, set in 1993, there was a huge um, blue collar um, movement or you know feelings against uh, the Jews and I mean not so much the Jews then but the Arabs you know and but I mean France has this colonial legacy of Vietnam you know Indochina North Africa you know and all this so they they need to welcome all these people and also Senegal and you know, they need to welcome them, but, you know, they're taking their jobs. I mean, a man in the Marais was saying they're taking our jobs, and this was 1993. So I don't, you know, that immigre uh, phobia was, has been there for a long time. I don't think it's anything new. Um, in, in my standalone thriller, Three Hours in Paris, I got to go away from, from Amy and fashion and go to, you know, have a, an American sniper who was from Backwoods, Oregon, to get out there, you know, and, uh, you know, recruited and sent on a suicide mission to shoot Hitler. Spoiler alert, she missed. <laughs> but, but the rest of the story, you know, the cat and mouse and how she has to, you know, also save, save the British from invasion uh, was very much real, you know, 
I, I put an American there because I just wanted to make it hard for her. But, um, you know, all that was there. It's just, you know, what's highlighted, you know, history is written by, what do they say, the victors, right? So um, Hitler did go to Paris for three hours. He never returned. Two of the men that were with him in his group, which you can Google and watch them on YouTube do this tour, Arno, Arno Brecker, the sculptor, and um, Albert Speer, the uh, armaments uh, architect, were with him after survived the war and later wrote two differing accounts and two different dates of being there with him and they're in the picture. So I think there was a story there. So I think it's about taking what you sense, what you feel, what you hear, what seems to be the mood at the time and trying to be real and uh, truthful to that time. You know, if I write about Paris in 2001, I feel it's only fair to, to hopefully, you know, have it reflect that as much as I can make it, you know, because otherwise why, why write it? You know what I mean? I'm not saying I'm the expert, but I think you, you need to reflect that time or that mind set of maybe even certain groups. Yeah, um, Kara, right, you're, you're really, you know, through the series, the 20 books, you're really almost like mapping the city. And so I was gonna ask about, you know, particularly because this also had something, a real event that you were relating to, uh, does the arrondissement speak to you in such a way that you choose that location to place your book? Or have there been other specific events that are really the, the focal point um, of, the, of other books? How, yeah, does, I mean, how does your I, choice, how does the choice evolve? Well, Laura, I only had two arrondissements left, so I had to pick one of them and then I'm working on the other one, so. So if I'm going to write that arrondissement, I really wanted it to dictate the story, you know, why it would happen here, what kind of crime happens here, why, who lives here, who would be affected, why would Amy be there, you know, all that, you know, to make it thread it, thread it together. And that's what I found, you know, I was like, how do I, I was like, how do I, you know, everyone's, it's so boring here, it's just families, and how, you know, how can I pick out something and what can I use? What you know? And then I started meeting people who lived there. I had them walk. I walked around with them. I said, "What was it like when you were growing up?" You know. And there's always these great stories. You know. And it's really just about typical Parisians. You know, who live their lives and you know an ordinary person dealing with extraordinary events, which really was what I felt. And I felt you know I really struggled with that though. How am I going to? make this place interesting. I didn't have to make it interesting. Actually, when I started digging, I could find things, you know, that were fascinating and, and they had a different kind of history. You know, Georges Brassin, the folk singer. I mean, he hung, he lived there, you know, uh, he hung out there. There's an old cafe we got into it that they only open and where Edith Piaf used to go, um, where um, all those kind of, you know, Johnny Holiday, all those those people would go and they have their pictures on the wall and it's like it came out in 1960 you know um and but they're you know they only open it for a certain time of the day and it's like well, you have to know a code word you know and it's dirty <laughs> it's just french you know so i mean those kind of things were really great to find as you could find anywhere right you just have to go down and dig and deep and you know um but again, it's it's it really it felt to me that you know this Amy's dealing with family issues. This place is all about family, and also one thing we didn't discuss is it's another theme is witnessing, because in this story, people see things, people are witnesses, and when I talked to the fleeks, and when I they said people lie to us, people lie all the time. When I talked to a cop here, people lie, right? When I, I mean, when I was speeding and the cop pulls me over, and go, oh, but I wasn't, you know, I, you know, right? I mean, we, you know, <laughs> we all lie, right? I mean, and especially there's a young teenager in this, you know, who's caught smoking, you know, and, uh, and uh, which, you know, in France, they still don't want their kids to smoke. But, and, you know, I was like, I remember when I was hiding in my room, my mother would come in, no, that's not smoke, you know, <laughs> you know, we all have a, a 
we all lie, you know, and why would you lie? Why, why do you think you'd lie if you witnessed a crime or you witnessed someone running away or for whatever reason? And why would you lie? And I said to cops and they said, there's a hundred reasons, you know, first of all, you'd lie about that because if you said you were there, you could, first of all, risk the danger from the person, if that's what you felt, it depends. You could risk that you weren't supposed to be there. You're playing hooky from work. You know, you should have been at work. You were, you shouldn't have, you were having an affair and you don't want your wife to fight. I mean, there's, you were, you know, whatever, you know, so many reasons you don't want to witness, you know, witness and help um, because you put yourself at risk. And what is, but what is our responsibility of being a witness? You know, we all have a responsibility. Do we do we honor it or you know not? Or do we have to be constantly pulled in until Amy can get the truth out of someone? What did you really see? Come on, you know, you know, because that's sometimes what you have to say, you know. I won't tell anyone, you won't get in trouble. Just tell me what happened. Someone's life is at stake. You know, you got to get down there and dirty to get them to tell you. And 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 really witnessing. You know, it's just it has it's fraught with with a lot of issues. I think it's complicated. I mean, so, I hope that if I saw something, I would I would be honest. I hope I would. You know, depending where I was, right? This this might actually lead to uh, the next question, which is again from Kate. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading the new book and wonder how motherhood is affecting Amy which since you brought up teenagers and uh, truth telling and all that, that might kind of dovetail nicely into the- Yeah. <laughs> well, we've gone through the whole thing of Amy finding out she's pregnant, dealing with her pregnancy, having the baby by herself, and then Melak, the biological father, you know, getting horning in, trying to get, we've had all these sagas and, and now we're at where they've sort of come to some uh, kind of sort of relationship, but she doesn't feel that great about it. But he's, but Melak is a good father when he's there, you know, when it suits him, but he's, I mean, he will, you know, he can, you know, he will do it. He's very, and, and Chloe loves him. So, and Amy is grateful that he's around, that he's someone she can do depend on. She doesn't, you know, she misses Chloe, but I mean, it's nice to know, um, but she doesn't really want to move to Brittany. So that he brings a whole other layer of complication um, and she's always thinking about her because she is always hoping that she will never make mistakes or be like her mother, you know, and that's something she's always dealing with. A couple of books ago, she was also, of course, you're always dealing with this and your guilt as a mother that you're not there, you have to work or all those other things. But she's, there was one part where she realized that it's also how she is wired. You know, and I think that was a great realization for her. I think it was in that two books ago where, I mean, here is Boris. Here is the man who was like Chloe's babysitter, a man she loved, a man who's there for her, who went to get Chloe's birthday present, who, who has Chloe on the face of his phone, okay? He loves Chloe, who goes to get her birthday present and he's accused right or wrong of doing this, you know, and how, you know, she knows she's wired in a way that she will not let this go. And she will, she's not going to stay home. You know, she can find, she has, Chloe has a wonderful babysitter. She has, Marty, she has a great network. So Chloe is not abandoned, but that's how she's, she sort of realized I'm wired that way. But of course she's always, you know, there's a push and pull, I think. As a mother feels, no matter what you do, you always do something wrong. The there's one day... The one day I never picked, my, I was late picking my son up from school in second grade. The one day that I, I couldn't, I didn't have a cell phone. He, I mean, he's 33 years old and he tells me about that. <laughs> the one day, you know, you're, you're always going to get something wrong. I said like, but what about all the zillion other times I was there? But no, you know, anyway. There's a question from Barbara Benjamin. I recently saw a panel of mystery writers, one of whom said she stopped writing books in her previous series because she said, series are a harder sell these days. Do you think this is so and why? I don't find that. I think people like series. At least that's what my editor tells me. We all have different experiences. I don't know what she, uh, what the author writes, you know, what kind of mysteries. Um, but I think you can write uh, one series and then start writing another series too. 
But I think a lot of the editor, my editor, that's all I know is my editor says, I like series because we have one that we know we can get to the next one. You know, doesn't mean you're going to write 20 like I have, but I mean, you know, it's nice to, I mean, I like to read series, but I think it's about keeping a series fresh and keeping it, um, yeah, keeping it fresh and interesting and being excited about it. And yet bringing that wonderful cast of characters that we know and love, you know, and let's be with them again. I mean, that's what I feel literally about series I love. I love Deborah Crombie who writes about England. I love her series. Now, I mean, they've had marriages and extended families. and can't, I mean, they've had cancer and custody. You know, they've had this whole family saga many years. But I love to be with those people. But Deborah does not write the same story every time. It's always a segment you know, of, of where the family is at that time. And I said, so Deb, you know, when I was, I said, how, how much backstory do you put in? How much does the reader need to know about all the, you know, long, you know, all the family and everything? And she goes, I only put in what is relevant to this story, you know, which makes sense. You know, if you want to read, you know, you need to read this story and get who these people are, get this world and, and like it. It doesn't hinge on the other stories except the series reader will we'll go to it because it does hinge, you know, we're going in that world. So, um, because I said, oh, I love when she's always fighting, can, can we have the sister back when she fits the story? <laughs> so I think that's a really good rule of thumb. You can write series, multiple series, as long as it's fresh and you, you put in enough backstory just to, to as needed, you know. There is a, um... Hold on just a minute. Um, Kate Farrell also wants to congratulate you on the LA Times, getting the LA Times pick for the top mystery books this winter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just saw that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Kara, also, I mean, I just love how you've got this macro world of the political world, and then you just go deep down into the personal stories of each of these really colorful characters and the whole, her very colorful extended family. And also just the very particular, there's, there's, a, there's a moment, because I'm reading, I have been reading the galley, you know, where Ame is, she's you know, outside at the beginning of a chapter and she's double knotting her scarf. And it's like, Oh, double knotting a scarf. You've got to just imagine that, you know, the French, the lady, French ladies with their small scarves that you have to just double knot that scarf in, in the chill of the night. And it's like, you can just imagine, imagine her doing that. And so I just want to you to talk about capturing, you know, the essence of uh, a Parisian woman and Parisian culture and some of the fun things that you've discovered along the way to put in your books. Well, thank you. Thank you a lot. Um, thank you. I mean, I, you know, I, of course, am not stylish as Amy, but I think Amy to me, you know, I want, I go window shopping with her in Paris, you know, I'm, she's always on my shoulder now. You know, those shoes are like, or, you know, because it's fun, right? It's like this person, like, would you wear that, wouldn't you? Or, and um, I found this one maternity store where they have the coolest, hippest, you know, female French Parisian maternity. I was like, I can't even be wearing this. <laughs> it was really fun. But I think, I mean, I think Parisian, the Parisian look that I admire are, is the look that looks effortless, right? Effortlessly thrown together, tousled yet perfect, you know, great sheet and yet, you know, they just, and they have a few really good pieces in their wardrobe, you know, and it's, you know, and they mix and match and put things together. It's not like they're constantly buying couture or brand names, you know, they have good quality pieces and they work with that. And I think to do that is, is real, uh, real fashion sense, you know, I mean, that's what Coco Chanel was always saying. You have a good piece, you know, you work with it. So Amy can go to the Port de Vin flea market I don't know if the ladies in there anymore. There used to be a lady who had a vintage Chanel, mostly Chanel, and it was like, oh my God, even that was beyond my, you know, out of my rack. <laughs> but it was good stuff, you know, cleaned and, and everything. And you could even stand and try things on, you know, and it was, it was real. I mean, it was, and she took very good care of these pieces. I mean, you know, you would buy it if you could, you know, because it's an investment piece, you know, 
She didn't need to tell me that. I could see it. You know, with those little nubby, uh, you know, the Chanel jacket that you could put on with the suit, you could wear with jeans, you could do whatever you want, right? That lasts you forever. It's timeless, you know? So, I mean, I think that kind of look is what she's kind of learns by osmosis, right? I mean, it's, you know, I don't have it, but she's born with it. That's all I can say. And of course, she can borrow her friend Martine's clothes because they're the same size and the same shoe size, which is, you know, Martine has that, like those velvet um, Yves Saint Laurent smoking jackets. You know, she can just borrow that, right? <laughs> Wouldn't you want a friend like that that would, a jacket that would fit you? And in this, Amy wears a leather cat suit that I've gotten a lot of comments from people who read this book because it's perfect for roof work and looking sheaf while you're on the roof on doing surveillance. And come on, I mean, you want to look good, right? <laughs> it was really fun to write that scene. Yeah. One other question I had uh, for some of the writers that are in the audience, um, you know, with your book, it, you know, you, on page one, you know, she's, sitting in that cafe and then pow, something's gonna happen. And then, you know, it's like a horse race. You're just off and running. And so my question to you is how, as a writer, do you keep up that suspenseful pace? Um, do you have certain techniques that you utilize to really keep that, it's a momentum that, it, you know, in a good mystery novel, it's gonna, it just keeps you going and keeps you going to the next page, uh, which is, it's, 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 it's really, a, it's miraculous to me. I don't know that I plan that, but I think um, I remember what a lot of like Stephen King or uh, all these books and writing I've read, you know, um, it's always about asking a story question. You know, the first page, there's a story question and the reader wants, to, it's a book I want to read, you know, what, you know, here's a story question, what's going to happen? So you want to turn the page and find out. So, you know, there's, there's many techniques, but I just try, I try to write scenes when I'm writing, you know, a scene where, Amy is with Renee and they're in a cafe and they're discussing something and they put, to, put something together and they have a new line of inquiry or new evidence has, you know, someone calls with the new information. So then they go on to the next, you know, locale or, or whatever. Um, and, you know, of course that would be something that's a piece, of, a piece of the puzzle, right? It's not, so you're still thinking that while you're, you're investigating, she's not a cop, she's a private eye and, but it's her friend while you're trying to find you know what happened what you're investigating you're just finding and assembling these little pieces and find, trying to put the puzzle together so you can always be in the detective with you know leave a unanswered question at the end of a chapter because as a detective you wouldn't know either right you would you know so it feels i feel kind of truthful you know it's kind of where you'd be so i think you're you're raising questions and you're letting the reader, sometimes, I was in a writing group and this woman said, oh, I know, she took the last line off of my chapter and it was perfect. <laughs> you know, sometimes we explain too much, but you, you know what I mean? So sometimes a little less is more, but not neglecting fleshing out a character or providing deep insight, you know. But again, it's kind of leaving questions because we're not, we don't have to answer them. We have to propose them. I think. I think that helps. I, I'm no. I'm no expert. Great. Thank you. Any other questions for Kara before we sign off? Oh, only a comment from someone saying I like series. And um, my only comment is I think that so long. You know, as as, as long as long form, particularly on you know on, on TV, is popular, I think I don't see why why book series would go out of style. It seems to, the styles seem to complement each other. Um, I do not see any other um, questions or comments. I have one quick question. Kara, have any of your books been um, offered or contracted for film or movies? Um, yeah, uh, the Amy books have been optioned yet again. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if it'll happen. It would be really nice if it would. So, great. Cross fingers. Well, great. Yeah. Well, I want to thank Kara Black for joining us again. We're going to keep you all in suspense uh, for the next week. Uh, it will be uh, out in bookstores and available on March 15th. 
So, um, uh, so merci. Here it is. Yes, we'll we'll both hold the, the book up, get that close up here, and uh, thank you for explaining about about the books and the book market. That's that's a that was a, a wonderful locale. So thank you. Uh, well, thank you for letting inviting yeah. me, and thank you for coming, and thank you, Laura and and uh, Pat and and Kate. Nice to see you, and uh, you know, hope to see you all in person, right? Okay, a bientôt.